From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, from the doors, John Densmore. With Gina Grad on news, Walt Bryan on sound effects, and Jake Paul drops by to recap Saturday's fight now. Since his bedroom growing up was a service porch, he's done plenty of safe outdoor dining. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get it on. Man, did you get it on? Thanks for tuning in and thanks for sharing with a friend. Right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. Hey, Mike, he's talking about you, you fuck ass. Uh, I know it's a different Paul, but it's just. They're just so delightful. I was. I woke up this morning and I turned on the TV set and I had an episode of Leave It to Beaver on. Oh, and are we pivoting? Are we pivoting away from Love Boat? <laughs> well, it's, it's much more it's much more wholesome than Love Boat. The reason oh, the reason Leave It to Beaver was on is because the last thing I watched last night was Love Boat, and it's on the same network. So, and I normally don't go into the 50s, 60s stuff. I'm much more interested in the 70s, 80s stuff. And like I said, you know, watch TV commercials from the period, watch TV shows from the period, and it'll kind of let you know where we're at. So what did Lumpy and the Beave do this time? I was, well, I'll tell you, like I was watching, uh, I was watching Bewitched the other day. And it's the relationships between men and women. It'd be like Darren would come downstairs and say to Samantha, like, what's going on? Where's my breakfast? And then she'd go, oh, sorry, dear. And he'd go, I'm running late for work. And she'd go, I'm sorry. And she'd like scurry into the kitchen. She knew she had messed up. Right. Now, had, you know, she, now what Darren didn't know is she was just talking to Dr. Bombay and trying to fix some mess that Endora cooked up. But- Hey, I'm sorry, real quick before you move on. Um, we know that that would be the bewitch situation. This was my breakfast this morning in bed. Uh, oh. Let's see. Sunny side up eggs, bacon, uh, looks like some hot sauce. Two kinds of hot sauce. Couple Two of- kinds of hot sauce and a note that says you are lovely. Wait, is it your birthday? No. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> so, is it Valentine's you Day already? You- nope. Yeah, see, I, I don't abide. I do some digging. You can't do the just because shit. And the reason you can't do the just because shit is because then when the necessary shit comes up, like birthdays and anniversaries mm-hmm. or a parent dying, now yeah. now you've broken even. You know what I mean? That's, That's true. Yeah. It's just called, now it's just called a fucking Monday. You right. can never, hey, guys, the just because, knock it off. Nobody needs that. You Scratch wait for, Chris, for Christmas, <laughs> birthdays, holidays, and tragedies, you know, stillborn, mm. things like that. Stick to the main food Stick groups. Stick to the big food groups. So uh, Maybe an unfertilized egg is not the best for stillborn. Yeah, you're right. That's you know, right. Yeah. <laughs> you go scrambled or basted. Oh, so, it's worse. <laughs> you're right. So, uh, so I get up this morning and leave it to beavers on, and the big dilemma also, you just see how they interact. You know what I mean? Like the dads are just wearing cardigans and ties and slacks, like just around. It's leisure time. Yeah, yeah they're le- relaxed. Leisure time. They get to put the cardigan on. They don't take the tie off. And then a uh, lot of guys reading the newspaper. The dads oh, just yeah. read the newspaper. The dads just sat in the living room and there's no radio on. There's no TV on. They just read the newspaper. And they'd all sit around the table and, you know, breakfast and like dad's wearing a tie, you know, and then, you know, the kids are saying things like may I be excused, you know, and all that yep. kind of stuff. And the parents are just giving advice and the kids are listening and the parents are going, no, you can't do that. So Wally, the older brother, oh. Wally's the older brother. Wally's probably 15 or 16. Wally gets he's going to the prom or the sock hop or whatever and he's got his date and then this dilemma comes up which is uh who'd you say cubby chubby lumpy lumpy his real name's clarence but they call him lumpy lumpy was going to take everybody over like all the couples in his car and there's like eight four couples eight people in the car so the beeves sorry you're probably thinking about eddie haskell 
Now, Haskell oh, okay. wasn't, this was Lumpy, I think. Gotcha. Okay. And Lumpy was going to take him over to the, to the sock hop in the, uh, in the car, but the Beeves parents didn't like the way it sounded that, uh, mm. there's going to be eight kids in this, this car. It sounded dangerous to them. Progressive. <laughs> right. So the, so the Beeves parents said, uh, look, uh, Wally, the dad said, uh, Ward said, mm-hmm. uh, I will drive you to the sock hop. And Wally said, I can't be seen pulling up with my dad dropping us off. Like, how would that look? Yeah, so he was in a real dilemma. And uh, what, how was he going to get there? His date, his date, I'm sure was all uh, excited about going out with the kids. And now he, Wally was going to have to explain to her why, uh, that why he couldn't do it. And uh, again, the parents, he didn't want her parents dropping him off or whatever, uh, his parents dropping him off. So he went to her home to explain to her a couple days before the dance that uh, this just wasn't going to work. And of course, she'd already purchased a matching set of a purse or a little handbag, uh, matching gloves. Oh, and God. and matching shoes. Was a, oh, a bygone yeah. accessory. Yes. And so she's are ready ready to go. And uh she said, I I gotta fix. I can fix this problem. And uh Wally said, Oh good, and he was relieved and he went home. Uh well he didn't know what the fix was. The fix was she was gonna drive them to the prom, to the mm-hmm. sock hop. And of course, this was unacceptable because you couldn't pull up with the woman driving. Ah. Oof, ah. And this was a big deal to, to Wally. And so what happened is uh, Wally didn't know how they were getting there. She, he just knew that she had fixed the problem. But when uh, she pulled up to the house or when the car pulled up, the beeve was looking out the window and, uh, he said, uh, Wally, uh, guess who just got out of the driver's seat? Your date. And Wally was like, oh, my God, I'm not I'm not coming downstairs. Oh, no, I, the night's ruined. I can't do this. And uh, I, I pulled the clip and I'll, I'll play I'll play the clip. Ward went up to talk to Wally. He went he didn't know what was going on. What's taking so long? Your date is downstairs. She's waiting for you. Why aren't you coming downstairs? Uh, he said he was sick. So here it is. I'll play the clip. What happened? I'd rather croak than pull get up a free ride with, his, with his date driving. <laughs> Must have been made sense back then. The audience laughed after every line. Oh, yeah. They ate it up. They totally related. Well, <laughs> you, again, when you make a sitcom, you have to be making it for the exact month we're living in. You know right. what I mean? Like yep. whatever it yep. is. You're talking about, I'm sure we'll go back and look at stuff and it'll have Black Lives Matters and all that kind of stuff, all the different stuff in it. And we'll go, that's exactly what was, oh, they'll be talking about coronavirus and Black yep. Lives Matter. It'll be dead nuts on right where we're at. And it has to make sense. No one, mm-hmm. you can't sit home and watch and go, what? I don't identify with this or what does this mean or this, I, where do they dig up this trope? It means nothing. So- uh, yeah, Leave It to Beaver never got accused of being too hip for the room. So it must have been something everybody understood. 1957 to 1963. So in that period, this was from 1961. In 1961, it was considered weird and embarrassing for the woman to drive the car and uh, that he would be ridiculed <laughs> by all the fellas if she was Here. driving. And suicide. and uh, about the croak. And he'd rather croak. They also, I mean, obviously there's a couple of quick fixes if you really need to, which is uh, just drive down to the uh, sportsman's lodge and then uh, a half a block out, just swap seats. You, you know, he'll he'll yeah. he'll pull it in. He'll bring it home. Yeah, he'll bring it home. And also it's always weird that all the guys are just standing out front the entire time. Like, uh, show up 20 minutes late. Let him get in there and, and uh, have a little punch. Show- Show up during the second song. Yeah, right, right. But uh, either way, I thought, I thought, wow, look at us. In uh, wait, yes, did he get in the car? 
Uh, yeah, he, he ended up getting in the car. He ended up, I don't know, somehow learning his lesson and, uh, all was, all was forgiven. And then there was a very controversial date rape scene that took place in the locker room. (laughs) Yeah. That, uh, did not see that. No, especially for the, for the times. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, but I, I just thought all you have to do. I, I wasn't looking for anything. I just turned the TV on, and there it was. Like it comes that, to you. It just comes right to you. You have to watch any of those shows, and all they do is explain where we were, when we were. Yes, yep. Dana. I was watching um, an episode of 30 Rock the other night, and you know, we just binged because it's just such a great show. 30 were, Rock? About 30 years too late. Well, that's the thing. It's, you know, you think it's a modern show. It, it feels like it just went off the air. It's all of the people who are still relevant now. You know, what what could possibly be weird or, or cringy about 30 Rock? It's the best. And there were a couple of jokes that I was like, oh, there is literally no way in November of 2020 you would have made that joke. Like the one that stuck out to me and I should have pulled the clip, but I didn't know we were going to talk about it. Um, when Matt uh, Damon plays Carol, the pi- the the airline pilot, mm-hmm. and, you know, he's like, OK, I got to go from Ohio to Miami to um, Jersey City to Atlantic City back to Jersey City and then I'll be there. And she says, who flies from Jersey City to Atlantic City? And he goes, black bachelorette parties. All right. Yep. And just stuff like that, you just wouldn't say. That's funny. Um, a note for Brian that I heard yeah. uh, apropos of uh, nothing, which was the uh, top movie of grossing movie of this uh, last weekend. The uh, top grossing, I, I don't mean pay per view, I just mean in theaters, in where, theaters wherever yeah. there are theaters. Uh, Tell me, I can't even guess. No I mean, theaters. Freaky? No theater Mm-mm. here. Oh God! The animated, the the glue, the crudes, the crudes oh. animated film. Uh, uh, people got to get the kids out. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wasn't even really thinking about the film. I was just thinking about the top grossing film of the holiday weekend, which is you know normally blockbuster stuff. Oh my God! It was dominated by Harry Potter and T- Toy Story for years. Oh. You know, they they really Tens cleared the millions. field this year. <laughs> Fourteen million bucks. That is the yeah. top That's grocer. Where we are. That's it's gonna where be we weird are. to look back at the year. You know, I'm sure Tenet's probably gonna be the number one film, but it's gonna be like 150 million, which is there's billion dollar movies these days, the Avengers and whatever. Yeah. And uh God out here in California, God knows when uh, the theaters are gonna open because uh we ain't, we're, we're busy going the other direction. So yeah, I good luck. I, I just got a breaking news thing right now that says Governor Newsom considers reinstating stay at home order, like stay at home order like we did back uh, last season. All right. Well, nobody should do that. And maybe this will be the beginning <laughs> of a little civil disobedience. Um, also, I woke up this morning, not because I wanted to wake up. I had a longish night. Phil fucking yacked last night in the middle of the, oh. the night. And, uh, oh, some socks. He Baby. got, he got he, that fucking dog. I figured out that he can get shit off the countertop. The countertop is 36 inches tall. And if you leave something on the countertop, he's getting to it. But, uh, I didn't know he had the range to get this shit off of the bar top, which is another six or eight inches up. That's the high one. Oh, Good yeah. Game. He got the stuff. Ate a he whole... plays above the counter. That's right. He does play above the counter. He got a whole bag of uh, uh, pita chips and uh, and bread and whatever else and devoured it. Oh. And that wasn't the problem. The problem is he always eats half of the sack that the shit is in sure. as well. Goat stomach. So he brought out of plastic circulating. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, he's like that big island in the in the ocean, size that's of right. Texas. So he's, he yacked up like you know part of a bag and a flip flop, and uh, and I was uh, I was dealing with that, and then I went back to bed and I was like tossing and turning, and at uh, seven forty five this morning, I got the fucking backup beeper, and the oh. backup beeper there's 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 a bad backup beeper. There's the garbage. There's the garbage man backup beeper, which is all right. The truck pulls up, and then the truck backs up, and then the truck turns out of the driveway or whatever it is, and it's neat, neat, neat. But it's it's kind of temporary. But there's a new backup beeper, which is 
there they were doing some building, not even not next door, not on my street, just sort of like across the valley, just like literally a quarter mile away. But you could just hear it clear as a bell ringing through the valley, which is the guys that are driving the excavators and the bobcats. They're doing this move where they go forward drop a scoop, then back up 20 feet, oh. then go forward again and drop. So it's just silent for 20 seconds, and then it's neat, 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 because they just keep shifting it yeah, in yeah. reverse. So all, yep. all they're doing is going back and forth and back and forth. And I, oh, I, I, I know the answer. I know they have stuff in Europe that's like, I don't know, ultrasound or something. Mm-hmm. It doesn't affect everybody. This shit, I'll, I'll play it. Uh, I got the du- I got the dual glazed windows in the house. Like I had the dual glazed windows. I had my earplugs in, and I had the fucking ceiling fan going, and it was still deafening. But I'll, I'll play the outside of the house first. I think it's me standing in my yard. Yeah. I, think, I think we'll get more than one here. This is 350 yards away. You're a patient man. The, let's see if it keeps going or not. I just randomly held my phone up in my backyard. Oh, now we, now we have the dueling. Now it's dueling. Okay. I'm in my bathrobe. I'm 400 yards away. Uh, I then went in the house and actually closed the door and thought, well, what does this sound like inside of the house? There's the same. If anything, it's clear. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the white uh, noise is cut down. The wind. Yeah, the argon gas in between the panes of glass somehow have amplified, amplified it. But I, I say to myself all the time, all right, you're fucking fucking with everybody within a quarter mile radius of this thing, and there's nobody getting out of the way. Why does this need to be heard from such a great distance? Couldn't it just, couldn't we just bring it in a couple decibels? And this shit used to just be on like municipal vehicles. Now it is on every single piece of equipment and like half the Ford F-150 pickup trucks. Like when, when are we going to deal with this scourge? How many, I've said to my, I've said it out loud a few times. How many of those beeps have you heard in your lifetime? And the answer is several hundred million. How many times have you gotten out of the way? Zero? No need. I'm at, I'm no at need. zero. I'm on a construction site. Most usually yeah, blocks away. Most of the stuff I hear, I'm in bed. <laughs> like there's, I guess I could roll over, but I, I don't know if that there's much, uh, much strategy to that. I, Jesus Christ, like whatever it is they're doing in Europe or whatever it is they figured out, could we fucking implement it here? And I don't think we really get into noise pollution or sound pollution, but it's, it's not a good one. It's, it's, it, it's a pollution. Okay. That, that thing that, that like we, you know, we probably wouldn't tolerate it if someone was smoking nearby, but that can that will just go throughout the neighborhood. Like, obviously, I'm not the only one hearing it. They start at 730 in the fucking morning. And I know everyone would get sued, but there's got to be a way to switch that fucking shit off. Somebody's got to put a kill switch on it. And how about the poor guy driving the Bobcat? That guy's just going back and me, 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 me. You think the M is totally numb and don't even notice it? Yes. They're totally numb and don't don't even notice it. And I think it's also, also ironically, it knocked off. They were completely done by nine thirty in the morning. Like they save all the fucking super loud shit for the beginning. I also for sunrise. I couldn't drive one of those things because I would be going insane. I'd be like, I, everyone around me can hear this every time yeah. I shift it in reverse. I'd put it in neutral and have the crew push me backwards. <laughs> the scary trend is it's going to get worse. My brother drives a UPS truck and he just got a brand new truck for his route and he puts it in park and it beeps. It beeps in, in park. park. Oh, yep. yep. And it's and he's numb to it now. <laughs> to a lot of people that is yeah. not moving. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, and and again, my thing is is 
people need to hear this, I suppose, that are within a 50-foot radius, let's say, of the piece of equipment. But why a nautical mile? <laughs> well, why does it why does it have to carry that far into the air? I have a possible, I wouldn't call it a solution, but it would definitely be a lot better. Instead of the constant beep, couldn't they just give the driver a megaphone and one time before he reverses, he goes, back! Yes. And that's it. Uh, It'd be nice, but it'll never... Like you said, Adam, I don't think radius even is important because you're only going one direction. It's not omnidirectional. Right. <laughs> yes, it's, it's You're true. only going in one direction. That's a good point. It's just the people that are literally five feet behind the thing who need to hear it. Um, all right. Uh, hey, here's a news flash. Uh, I'm now down with Black Lives Matter. And oh. the reason I'm down with Black Lives Matters is because uh, they've been protesting in front of Garcetti, our mayor's house, uh, six days in a row now. Mm -hmm. The out. enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's, That's right. right. They're down in at uh, Garcetti's place. And their list of demands, uh, well, a couple of the things they're protesting about is traffic. So, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the homeless situation too so they they've diversified their portfolio to say they diversified the message All right. yeah because yeah, it once once word got out that he might be in biden's cabinet yeah. they are doing everything they can to not make that happen and not get him on a national level <laughs> no. what the fuck kind of don't strategy is that <laughs> <laughs> don't they listen to the show what about my rachel perry strategy where she was going to leave the morning show for two weeks and then never come back like why what what do they want him doing? Hanging out here, fucking up homelessness and the traffic more? Yeah, I know. It's very short sighted. It's a. It is kind of a weird. It is kind of a weird thing. Like we could get a, we could get a mayor who wanted to get rid of homelessness and work on traffic, and then we could alleviate both those problems. Yeah, they're they're it's going a great to show. A lot of uh, fun. That's Jimmy Bruska, everybody. Former, former producer for the uh, Adam right, Carolla man. Morning Show. Yeah, so that's what they're protesting, uh, amongst other things. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, they, they just, they just think of him as the quote the, the worst mayor in the nation, racking up a dismal record of handling Los Angeles's housing catastrophe, providing for the city's growing unhoused population, and following through on transportation projects. Unhoused oh. population. Yeah. It's not homeless anymore. That's no. right. No. Urban you're, campers are unhoused. unhoused. Or houseless. That's what they're saying. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if Garcetti's even around, though. Like when they surround his his house, do you think he's in there? And if he is, how's he fucking get out? I don't or know he one. comes down Jackie Lacey's <laughs> husband style with a gun. <clears throat> yeah, Jackie Lacey's husband uh, came out with a pistol. Yeah, and threaten people to get off Start their porch. waving it around. Barbara Freer yeah. has a, a protest outside of her house. Yep. Yeah. She she does. Does. She's got, uh, but she's got like the restaurateurs yeah. or something in yeah. front wanting wanting her not to. She's the, uh, oh, look up, if you can look up her uh, bona fides, uh, if you look up her history, uh, where she went to college and like what she majored in and shit. This is the last human being you'd want to be setting policy for Los Angeles. She has zero experience in any of the any of the stuff she's dictating. This is not her field of expertise at all. It's 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 really weird and bizarre that we have the health I don't know what her exact title health director, is. Director, LA County Health Director. So the LA County Health Director is setting all these policies about restaurants not being able to uh, conduct business outside and about uh, what percentage of a business can be filled and you know what you can do on the beach versus the park versus your living room and what needs to be done for Thanksgiving and holidays and traffic. She's at uh, travel, I should say. She's setting all this, these policies and she has no background. In these policies or or in, in this, she has no field of expertise. What I suspect is that many, many, many politicians or at least people appointed to positions don't have the qualifications. They just know somebody, they're a friend or they you know, owe a favor or whatever. And the light never gets shined on it until something like COVID happens, an unforeseeable thing like COVID or um 
Remember that in Katrina and George W. Bush, like, Brownie, you're doing a hell of a job. Right. Spoiler alert, he wasn't doing a hell of a job. He was just some crony friend who ended up in whatever, whatever position he was in. And the, the light got shined on him. It's just a roulette wheel. Once, once in a while, the light got shined. Well, isn't that happening with Louis DeJoy and that, you know, the, the postal, the, the postal uh, workers and all that, how he got appointed? I well, sometimes the light will shine on you when you when you don't have the qualifications, and it's like, oh shit, well, well, election certifiers or whatever. You know, there's just in a cushy yeah. job. Well, it turns out you got to shine the light on anybody, and you just that's, find out they're doing a I'm shitty saying. job. Yeah, I agree. Uh, she has a PhD in social wel- welfare and a master mm. of arts. Yeah, find out the college. Oh, she went to Brandeis. Awesome, oh. and. Uh, she has a master in arts, public health from uh, Massachusetts, Boston, and then she went yeah, to where else? Master she... of Arts in Education from University of Massachusetts, and Bachelor of Arts in Community Studies from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Awesome, awesome, perfect. Just the person you'd want to to handle the economy of uh, of Los Angeles. Blah. Jesus Christ, let's get that witch the fuck out of there. We got All a real right. crackerjack team over here, oh man. Oh my god! I, I, the, could we just get a fucking bunch of physicians and guys from, uh, you know, uh, from go go find a bunch of physicians and epidemiologists, and then and then pair them with business people mm-hmm. and the guys at Bob Iger and stuff, and just put together a fucking crack team, and then start w- weighing the checks and the balances. All right, uh, let me tell you about uh, Axon Tasers. Yeah, 2020 feels a little unstable, a little dangerous. Yes, do not fear. Get yourself a, a taser. Mm-hmm. Could be life-saving uh, self-defense technology. Tasers, non-lethal self-protection devices are small enough to carry with you in your purse or your glove compartment, but powerful enough to incapacitate an attacker. Gina's got one of these bad mm-hmm. boys. I already, it's a peace of mind thing because yes, if I used it, it would probably incapacitate 14 attackers, but I don't know yet. But just the peace of mind and the confidence uh, and the security I feel carrying it is a big deal. And uh, yeah, get it for yourself, get it for your wife, get it for a loved one. It's uh, it's the real deal. And uh, you can protect yourself and your family with Taser Smart Self-Defense Products. Number one choice of law enforcement agencies, by the way. Am I right, Dawson? Taser is available without a permit in most U.S. states. Get the Taser Pul- Pulse Plus or Taser Strike Light at Taser.com with promo code Adam. Save 15% now at Taser.com, promo code Adam, spelled T-A-S-E-R.com, promo code Adam. Restrictions apply. See site for details. All right. Well, uh, Jake Paul, fresh off of knocking out Nate Robinson in uh, less than uh, two minutes into the second round, is going to uh, join us right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Breaking viral. All those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Give news with Gina Gino Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Jake Paul will pop on when Jake Paul pops on, and we'll do the news up until then and then beyond. Go ahead. Well, from the of course it is desk, we have a 2020 Merriam Webster dictionary name of the year. And what? Name of the year? Uh, word of the year. Sorry. I know and, doing uh, names. <laughs> the reason the reason why it's so funny is actually the last two of the top 11 words are the best. So we got to get into the story somehow. It is. I heard yeah. this yeah. news story in between watching uh, Leave it to Beaver, mm. which I call show prep. <laughs> and uh, I think I remember it was either pandemic or Bahamian. I'm trying to think. Pandemic, You're right about one of them. Pandemic was number one. Yes. I remember uh, the Kraken or Kraken was uh, was in yes, there. Yes, number some, five. Was yeah, in there the somewhere. And I can't remember. I can't remember the other ones. Well, you're going to love 10 and 11. So, you know, all the names that kind of make sense for the year. We got coronavirus, quarantine, asymptomatic was a big one. Oh, um, defund. We got mm-hmm. defund the police. Um we got a Joe Biden one, which is. Oh, yes. That's one of my that's that's number 11. The one I was so excited about. His is and like the, he calls. No, don't say it. Okay, go ahead. No, 
Oh, oh yeah. there it is. That was his home guess, malarkey. But, uh, yes. That was malarkey. Number 11, because people had to look it up. But number 10 is uh, also sort of poetically perfect for 2020. The number 10 most looked up word of the year, schadenfreude. Wow. Really? Yeah. And I think that has to do with people getting COVID. Oh. You know, all, I think that it's it makes perfect oh. sense. I, 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 I would imagine it was around the time maybe Trump got uh, coronavirus. Maybe. Yeah. Otherwise, why would you be happy your neighbor got coronavirus? Right. Or, you know, anyone. Thought who, it might be happy. That it <laughs> any, public, any public person who yeah. gets it, that, that name came up as a, uh, why is everyone talking about schadenfreude? What exactly does that mean? So, yeah, at the top we have. Uh, pandemic, coronavirus, and quarantine. At the bottom, we have Schadenfreude and malarkey. Has anyone famous died in a long time, and it has it been attributed to COVID? Well, uh, it did come out today. Talk about point shitting that the 95 year old man who played Darth Vader did die of coronavirus. Oh, Aww. did he? God, I hope. Does that count? I both. I hope both my kids die at 95 from the coronavirus. Amen. That is my. That is my wish. Way to go. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, the Dark Lord of the Sith, and he said, "Come to a fucking virus." Has that has, Nick Cordero is all I can think of. Nick Cordero is probably the youngest, scariest example. But yeah. is there anybody else? Is there any celebrity or dignitary or public figure in like the last four months, or, or under the age of of seventy? That's who, a good caveat. Who has uh, who has died of this? And if the answer is no, then we shouldn't be all that freaked out because we would know it. If, if somebody we knew of, somebody we'd heard of that was 47 died of coronavirus, they would be making a fucking huge deal about it. So uh, if you, uh, you know, there's kind of two ways you can, you can look at things. You can, uh, you can crunch some numbers and get into some stats and, turn on the TV and be alarmed by uh, rising cases or hospital uh, beds being taken or things of that nature. But I want to, if I'm not hearing about people dying, then this thing is under control from the, from the perspective of the, it's a killer. You know, when you looked at something like AIDS, you got AIDS, you died. That's, right. that's simply how it was in the, yeah. the mid later eighties, early nineties, you got AIDS. You had to get your affairs in order, like immediately. Uh, when I start hearing about, like, well, the quarterbacks from the Denver Broncos got it, and uh, the the guys from the college team got it, and the other guys from the NFL got it, and the coach, uh, I don't know, uh, Nick Saban, has right. it, and blah blah blah. And you're like, okay, but what's happening? Then then what? Now what? What's going like on? You said, <clears throat> like you said on the show, we're getting better at treating it. Yeah, well, Not preventing it, but treating it. We're getting pretty damn good because uh, if 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 Nick Saban died, we'd know all about it, and uh, if one of the quarterbacks for Denver died, we'd know about it, and if the uh, Clemson quarterback who had it three weeks ago uh, was in trouble, we would we would know about it. So my thing is is uh, I think it is now something that you can get. I don't think it's going to kill you if you're not in this group. And so if you're not in that group, you got to get the fuck on with your life. OK, Chris, Chris was pointing out that uh, uh, a week and a half ago, we all went to a Florida wedding, a maskless Florida <laughs> wedding. So we should all we should all have it. And so should everybody from that uh, wedding. I don't uh, I, I either have had it 25 times or there's something there's something wrong. I have. <laughs> Literally tried everything I can do to get it. I'm, I'm like that episode of The Simpsons where Homer was where he became morbidly obese. And at first he was reading ways he could get out of work, like workman's comp shit. Uh -huh. And he was trying to get himself injured, injured at work. And he couldn't he couldn't seem to pull it off. And I feel like <laughs> too incompetent. Yeah, that's that's uh, I feel like that. Maybe I'm too incompetent to uh, be stricken with the coronavirus. That's possible. Gina has either late breaking news 
Oh, some sort of update. You know, perhaps her dad's or, situation. Or, uh, yeah, so Gina's muted herself. She uh, said... To answer your question, uh, the most recent famous person I can find, I would forgot about this, was Tom Seaver. Of course, he was an advanced age, and that was, you know, I think early September, late August, something like that. Oh, uh, Hall of Fame pitcher, Cy yep. Young Award winning. Yeah, I remember Tom... would be surprised if he was 70 years old, though. I, I don't know. Tom Seaver. Um the uh sorry i'm looking oh okay looking at something else yeah how old was tom i remember chris can look that up i'm just uh i just saw him on a list i'm sorry gina go uh go ahead with your news very good thank you very much um well i hope you can't die from a twisted ankle because then joe biden needs to be real careful uh they said he twisted his ankle while playing with his dogs on Saturday, but now doctors say he suffered a hairline fracture in his foot and because it's going to look very presidential, wear an orthopedic walking boot for several weeks. Oh, it should have like a flag on or start. <laughs> That's right. Or yes. Um, now, this is kind of funny. I, Gary and Shannon on KFI said this, said, how many people believe he was he broke his foot roughhousing with his two giant German shepherds or just he just breaks something trying to step out of the shower. And that's a oh. horrible optic situation. Oh, yeah, right. Can't have anything in the bathroom. Yeah, that's for damn sure. Yeah. Have to come up with something. I believe it just because that's what they said. But it, it is true. If you think about it, you have to think of something that says virility. But yeah. you can't have banging a cocktail waitress. Or uh, fighting corn pop in an alley. Right. But I think playing with the dog feels feels pretty vital. Should I go with skiing? Ooh, rescuing a skier. Rescuing oh, a skier. Yeah, that's real good. So he'll, um, you know, if if we make it this far to you know the end of January, he maybe he'll hobble up there in his walking boot and uh, and uh, take the oath. Oh yeah, I wonder how long you got to keep that thing. He's probably going to be done with that That's by a month. then, it's right? It's over a month and a half. They said yeah. several weeks when I had it because remember I fell down the stairs at Cantor's waiting for my matzo ball soup. That's right. Um, I had. Remember, That's I had like to have my set up to a joke. I know it's the most Jewish thing I've ever said, and I had my foot propped up in the studio for like two months. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that could butt up against the, uh, 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 you know, the January twentieth date. Well, to be fair, <laughs> a young Jewish girl. <laughs> Not having the matzo ball soup had been almost 11 hours, I believe, since you'd had matzo ball soup. That's right. And so I was your going blood through withdrawals. Getting, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was getting Who's, the shakes. Mm. Who's the young Jewish girl? The shakes. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm going to ask a question. It sounds oh, Brian, insulting. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. <laughs> I should have realized. I, I'm going to ask a question. It's going to sound insulting, but it's actually completely genuine. She had to take her headphones off. Who oh, is the better athlete at this moment, Joe Biden or Gina Grad? <laughs> I can throw a spiral if I warm up for like 10 minutes. Okay. So Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I was intrigued by this um, $106 burger that AJ brought up on the show yesterday, the new Gordon Ramsay burger. And I said, if it's gold leaf, we don't want to hear about it. Or if it comes with a diamond ring, nobody cares. Right. So I did a little investigating and turns out it's probably legit. Uh, so he is opening a restaurant in London and um, I'm sorry, the, oh, is opening a London location of his Las Vegas restaurant at uh, in December. And everybody's talking about all the menu items that are pricey. Are there so, truffles on top? Well, of course, truffles are involved. Yeah, you got it. So yeah, that jacks up the price. This is going to be a Wagyu burger. Now, remember, I just had an almost hundred dollar or I was in the company of someone having a hundred dollar steak. So now I can believe that this is possible with Wagyu. It's a Wagyu sirloin, truffle pecorino cheese, oh, and course. fresh black truffles. Of course. It's $106. Fries are sold separately. And other uh, fries menu are items. sold separately. Separately. I, it's like a fine dining nerve. restaurant. <laughs> Uh, Seaver died at 75 in August from complications of Lewy body dementia. Oh, which that's what Casey that Kasem had. And COVID. But uh, I'm guessing if it was just the COVID, he'd probably still be uh, out at Old Timers Day throwing those pitches. Um, the, uh, you know, the thing about a burger like that is I, I like where they're at with it. I'm wondering when a burger ceases to be a burger. You mm. know, at some point when you heap on too much non-burger shit onto it, it becomes something else. Mm. And I'll bet you that most people who had that, what was it, $106 burger, yeah. 
would rather have 39 in and out burgers. <laughs> And I agree. spread out over the course of the next two years. All at once? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think you might be right about that. Other items include a $56 lobster and shrimp burger. Eh. Yeah. And $33 <laughs> burger, um, a Hell's Kitchen burger. It's mozzarella and jalapeno aioli. And you know what? Some people just want the basics. Keep it simple. An American cheeseburger with tomato pickle and onion, $28. Where do you guys, I'll bet you would enjoy that more than the highfalutin burger. Where do you guys come down on uh, what's on the burger? Uh, Onions. We going raw? We going grilled? I'll take either one. 51.49 for raw. I like the crunch. I despise raw onions. I don't think they're food. Mushrooms and onions are not food until you cook them. Grilled (laughs) and well done. I want Mm. them caramelized. I like everything on the burger i like the lettuce i like a big slab of tomato i like the raw onion for the most part and how about the uh, pickle love the love the pickle pickle. love the mayo love it all you know what as it pertains to this burger i'll be honest adam i know you like to marvel at my uh, highfalutin taste sometimes don't care for truffles never have no i prefer i i will never ask for truffles or order anything with them proactively well good news because no one volunteers truffles you got to ask for it. So if you're not asking, you're not getting. Who threw the truffles against the wall at the highfalutin dinner? Uh, cousin Sal, 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 when we were trying right. to run up the bill, the guy was coming by and he was grating the truffle over everyone's pasta or right. whatever they were eating. And, you know, each swipe of the grate was like 23 bucks or something. And at some, the truffle was the size of a baseball. And at some point, Sal said, like, well, how much for the actual truffle? Like, how much just to just leave give me the it? Truffle. I want yeah. bottle service with that truffle. <laughs> and the guy's like, I don't know, the truffle's like 1200 bucks or something. And then Sal grabbed it and threw it against the wall. That's, uh, <laughs> it's fungus. Yep. And it's $1,200. The ugliest oh, of so all good. Americans, Cousin Sal. <laughs> I can't believe he does this sober because he doesn't drink. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's great. That's insane. And again, everyone else drinks, but the real downfall with Baby Doll is he ain't making it through a two and a half hour dinner without going out for a smoke break a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. whenever he steps out for the smoke break, that's when the trouble really, that's when Sal starts sending <laughs> bottles of champagne to other tables <laughs> and this T-shirts. Swag. It's gonna be a great year for for baby doll. No, no dinner, right? Yeah, no, no yeah. he's he's saved himself thousands, thousands of dollars. All right, <laughs> let me hit uh, lids here. Need the perfect gift this season. Lids has them officially licensed sports gear or iconic brands like Nike, Adidas, and. Uh, champion lids is north america's largest hat retailer visit any lids store and uh, associate will help you find the perfect cap for yourself for the holiday or you know for a gift or a gift uh, especially kids love this stuff lids uh, is a leader in head headwear including all the authentic mlb on field caps nfl sideline caps knits uh, plus a huge variety of fashion styles uh, color uh, colors and uh, lids exclusives as well. You can visit uh, blog.lids.com slash Adam. Get 20% off your next in-store purchase. These guys uh, deal with the high-end stuff. And get a good hat. Fits good and you keep it for a while. Perfect gift is waiting. Visit lids. Again, blog.lids.com slash Adam for 25% off. Right, Dawson? Visit blog.lids.com slash Adam for your 25% off coupon next time for your next in-store purchase. All right. So Jake Paul was running late. Yeah, he hasn't. He had another interview before us, and that was going long, but he, he let us know he's going to be on any minute. All right. Keep going, Gina Grand. Well, there's always a way around something, and a tequila bar owner in England, is uh, he's right on top of that. So he's attempting to register his establishment as a religion in the hopes of meeting the regulations to keep his business operational during the pandemic. And Mark I think Garrick a lot of, to to his knees. <laughs> a lot of people are going to try something like this, I bet. Fox News reports that James Aspel, who owns the 400 Rabbits Bar, has admitted that his stunt is mostly aimed to raise awareness uh, about the plight of 
the England of England's bar industry, which I imagine would have been thriving. And it's in Nottingham. Uh, he's, it's currently designated a tier three area, meaning it can only remain open for takeout and delivery. We're used to that. But Aspel told Fox News he takes issue with the rules, questioning why other establishments like the big Christmas market nearby are still allowed to operate. Um, and they're all under the same tier. On his website, he says 400 Rabbits is also trying to grow a congregation, reportedly for the purposes of obtaining credibility as a recognized religion. The website, however, appears to make it clear that his efforts are largely ironic, despite the real concerns behind him. But if they if it goes through, it goes through. It's like the guy who always does the um, the crazy vanity plate you right. know, and stuff like that. Yeah, I heard some story about a crazy vanity plate and one of them, I think it said queer on it. But it obviously, well, not obviously, but the guy wasn't talking about being gay. It was more about queer, weird, or part of his name yeah. or his business or something. But uh, no moss. I don't know. The vanity plates. Do you guys feel like you see less and less vanity plates? Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, well, you know what I've noticed? And you guys may not have ever noticed this or tell me if you do here on out. There is an inordinate amount of vanity plates on Teslas out here in California. Interesting. Teslas have, have, a, yes. A, a lot have to do with, uh, you know, uh, EV or, you know, n no no gas or something like that. You know what I mean? Or yeah. some are just vanity plates. But I, I'm telling you, there's a disproportionate amount on Teslas. And less on Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> I just picked a car, a bad car from the 70s. Yeah, well, it, it, it's... This is your average car. No, it, it's, it's interesting. So you see pickup trucks and pickup trucks don't have a lot of vanity plates because those are just poor Mexicans going to mow lawns and go to work like they don't have there's no virtue signaling going on if you think about the group that is sort of signaling the most then maybe the Tesla group are the signalers mm. of of our society right now and if you're going to signal then continue the theme with the vanity plate Especially when you're going, getting into zero gas or zero greenhouse yep. or like whatever, right. whatever that thing is. I had, boy, we were, I was, you know, obviously I come from a super loser family and I had <laughs> right. a friend when I was growing up and his name was Jeff Buck and he came from a winner family. Like people say, have you ever been skiing or when was the first time you went skiing? It's like, yes, I went with Jeff Buck's family. And there's like, have you ever been water skiing? Yes. I went with Jeff Buck's family. Like I, I latched on to the families that had shit going on and I would go eat over there and go hang out and blah, blah, blah. And, um, his family, Oh, the, I, I think the Corollas could live 7,000 years and drive 7 million miles and there'd never be a vanity plate between us. But, <laughs> His family, the dad had one buck one, uh, the mom had two buck two, oh, the, boy. the yep. sister had three, but I just, just go in there and just stare at those plates and oh, the whole, everyone was represented yep. in the family. And I was like, oh, God damn winners. God Christy's, damn it. Uh, Christy's dad and her brother have the matching, uh, the matching uh, last name plates. Well, what are they? Oh, it, they have the matching, wait, her dad uh, uh, and the brother. Okay. Yeah, the last name is uh, Clough, and it's uh, Clough One and Clough Two. Oh my God! I'm I'm angry, I'm but I'm jealous. <laughs> is it is it now that people just don't want to fucking deal with the DMV in California? Like everything is such a hassle. I mean, is it is it that or we, what, what's a sign uh, of the times? It's like, you know, we don't want to if you're wealthy, you're not going to show that off these days. You're not going to be kind of in the look at me vibe. But Clough one's still on the road. The um, <laughs> it's not really a wealthy thing. Like the the people had them. It feels like it. I, it does feel like but I don't do think it's necessarily. It's it's literally eighty bucks or or something like that. Oof, like I don't think I'm it's out. I don't think it's expensive for the price of one hamburger in New York City. You could get a, <laughs> but I maybe with all the social media now and all the other ways we have to sort of uh, spread our word out there that that itch is scratched oh uh, like, no, that's, that's a good point we don't like there used to be the way you'd have to let the world know what you were thinking back in the day like hey i need strangers to know what i'm thinking well <laughs> what i'm all about bumper sticker yeah. license plate frame like vanity plate like the, how else would i share with the world what i'm thinking 
Yeah. And that's really kind of what social media is, is I need the world to know what I'm thinking. And now that, you know, you put on the vanity plate, you reach whoever's behind you at the stoplight. But if you do the tweets, then I'm going to reach hundreds or thousands of people. So maybe it's it's not effective anymore. Maybe maybe the maybe the part of the brain that wants to shout out to people is has been satiated by all the social media. That's a very good point. It does feel like from older generation, yeah. Also, um, the DMV is such a fucking shit show. I told you when I went there about a year ago to renew my license. I I don't really travel anywhere with cash or checkbook anywhere. When's the last time you left the house with your with your checkbook? Well, you unless know? I knew I had to, there's no reason to. Rolled into that DMV and I like pulled out my credit card and they're like, well, we don't do credit cards. I know We're you guys have heard yet. this. But the thing that made me laugh is they said they had a pilot program to start looking into accepting credit cards. <laughs> the, I, I feel like the guy out front of the fucking Staples Center selling yep. the hot dog wrapped in bacon well, has a fucking square on his phone that'll take yeah. the fucking credit card. Jesus, goddamn Christ. Hey, before we wrap this mm. up, what, what, what's Jeff Buck up to these days? I, I got to know, what the, is he still leading the life of a winner? Um, I don't know. Look up Jeff Buck. I think he was part owner and like a triple A hockey team or something. That's fucking sweet. <laughs> I think that was my last my last correspondence with him. But uh, you can look up that name. I think his dad. Oh, you know, his dad played for the last championship team that Cal basketball team that Cal Berkeley had. Oh, wow. That's a winner. That's cool. Looked like Patrick Duffy. My dad looked like Angel from Rockford Files. Everything is coming up, Buck. I know, and I think that was his last correspondence. But I don't know if you can look up Jeff Buck and see see if he's up. The, the internet is simultaneously incredible and disappointing. Well, you know, it's going to be hard with a common name like Jeff Buck. I don't know. Well, that's serious. That's kind of a common name. Well, Jeff is. I don't know that many. Well, there's Joe Buck, I guess. That it's same initials. Uh, yeah, a lot of Jeff Buckley that keeps popping But up. not a lot of, oh, I Hallelujah. see. Hallelujah. Yeah, I get it. All right, let me hit uh, Geico here. Do you own, do you rent? Well, you do one or the other. How about you, you listen to Geico? They'll make it easy to bundle those policies. You go to geico.com. You bundle your homeowners, your renter's insurance, along with your auto policy. And uh, there you go. Bob's your uncle. Go to geico.com. Get a quote today. See just how much you could save. At Geico, when you bundle at geico.com. All right, I should tell you that uh, COVID has po postponed my uh, Burbank Pickwick show oh, and they moved it back <laughs> to January 23rd. So, your uh, outdoor show. My outdoor show. The parking lot show. So, right. we got that uh, to look forward to. I think it's because you said something. <laughs> yeah, you've spoken into existence. Jake. Paul has not joined us yet, but uh, John Densmore, The Doors, is waiting to come on at uh, about five minutes or something like that. Yeah, about about ten fifteen. I pushed him back just a touch, just uh, for Jake. All right. Well, I'm not. Well, anyway, Gina, keep keep sure. going. But doesn't I got a million? All right, go ahead. So a sixty, and I hope. I thought maybe this is on Adam's list, like getting kicked out of a casino for counting cards, but I sure hope it's not. A 62-year-old man was discovered desperately clinging to the hull of his capsized boat in the waters off Florida on Sunday, about 24 hours after he was reported lost at sea. And we have pictures. The crew on board the container ship, Angela, the container ship called Angelus. There he is. It looks like a still from a movie. It's like Harrison uh, Ford. Spotted that's right. Spotted it kind of uh, with a little uh, Joaquin Phoenix uh, mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. uh, spotted this guy, Stuart B., around 11 a.m., about 86 miles off of Cape Canaveral, holding on to his 32 foot capsized vessel. Fox News reports that the Coast Guard had been searching for signs of the boater since he was reported missing oh, Saturday. Oh, shit. Can it's like underwater, save for the, uh, the hull. The yeah, keel. It's like no, kind of everything, the Titanic. Oh, everything's went down. under but the keel. Oh, wow. That's right. Condition isn't immediately known, but I say this is a hardy dude. If I made boats, and I'd probably be shouted down by this at the at the boat factory, but I'd be like, I've seen enough movies. We got to put some handles on the bottom of this boat. Oh, smart. and everyone go, but aren't you just asking for it to capsize? 
And I'd go, mm -hmm. I don't know. But every single movie I've seen where there's a sail sailboat and it hits rough seas, at some point it capsizes and the people are clinging to the super smooth fiberglass hull of the boat. And you know how much energy it takes to take your fully dressed, bearded, wet ass and crawl up the side of a super slick. I mean, that, that thing's like cr climbing a, a greased flagpole. Put a couple of handholds in there. Yeah. All right. A couple of pegs to stand on. Yeah, we may lose a couple of knots, you know, but it ain't the fucking America's Cup. Put a couple of those, you know, get, go online and, uh, you know, those uh, hand grabs for the fake rock climbing walls. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Toss a couple on the hull. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're fiberglass. They don't weigh much. Yeah, yeah. it'll be like those, uh, those airplanes when they advertise the private airplane that has the parachute on it. Right. I do yep. the same thing with this. Hey, hand grabs. Hey, yep. a lot of you call yourself sailors, but are you really? Number one. Number two, a lot of you like to drink. A lot of you, uh, you know, not so happy with the radio and the last mm. communications and all that kind of stuff. When this bad boy flips on you, you'll be able to uh, hang out on topside. Yeah. It'd be the best day yeah. of your life. Hmm. Maybe we'll put a cooler on there as well. Yeah, it couldn't hurt. Put a little jerky in there cooler. and some suds. <laughs> it activates when it flips over. We should put That's a radio great. on there. Let's, get, let's put a sleeping. Let's put some sleeping quarters a on the bottom ball. of the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's really. Buy, let's, let's let's. I don't say we need a wet bar, but obviously you're going to be parched. Right. All right. Sorry, yeah, Gina. You guys what ever see that uh, Robert Redford movie All Is Lost? Yes. Mm -mm, no. Oh, love that. One of the few movies that made me uh, weep openly. Yeah, he was just alone out at sea. And his He's the only one in the movie. Over. He's the only one credited. Right. And if he would have had handles on that hull, the movie would have been 11 all, minutes long. <laughs> easier life would be. So, you know, there's always somebody trying to, some tourism board saying, hey, now's a perfect time to come here since our economy is crashing because there's no tourists. Well, now it's Hawaii's turn. And they even have a slogan and everything. So now that people are doing the work from home thing, they're saying, why not work from Hawaii? They are reeling from having essentially no tourists right now. So they don't want tourists. They want people who will stick around and do the work from home thing, but in Hawaii. So they started the Movers and Shakas campaign mm -hmm. and the shock, you know, that hang loose gesture. It launched, uh, it launches Sunday as a campaign to attract former residents and those from elsewhere to set up their remote office. They're touting Hawaii's safety attributes, which are among the lowest rates per capita of COVID in the country. And the first 50 applicants approved starting Sunday receive a free round trip ticket to Honolulu. Applicants pledge to respect Hawaii's culture and natural resources, and you must commit to several hours a week helping a local nonprofit. Well, let me say this. This pandemic should be a wake-up call to all the nations and all the states and all the islands who rely solely on tourism. Re relying mm -hmm. on tourism as a nation or as an island or whatever it is, it's kind of like being a hot blonde in high school. Like you're just kind of getting by because everyone wants to fuck you. You know what I mean? When you're in, you, you know, when you're in, you're in uh, one of the Dakotas or Idaho, you got to fucking put out. Like you oh, better yeah. be manufacturing mini refrigerators like there's no tomorrow. You know, you need some fucking industry, you know. Show some appreciation. And this this uh, Hawaii is hanging back because they're like our crystal blue waters and natural waterfalls. And like we don't have to do shit. Everyone wants to hang out here. Everyone wants to fuck the hot blonde. But maybe whoever you are, whatever country and whatever state, eh, maybe this is your wake up call to fucking uh, get up before noon and start manufacturing something because this shit's going to happen periodically and you're just hanging back relying on this. You don't you don't you don't hear this problem with places that aren't relying on the tourism. Let California be a lesson to the rest of the world. We were that hot blonde. Now between droughts and and shootings and traffic and COVID numbers, nobody's coming here. Disneyland's closed. Right. Oh, why? That's right. All right, Gina, let's bring it home. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. All right, so we're going to bump Jake Paul because he was running late. We'll just put him, slot him in uh, somewhere else maybe tomorrow. But uh, legendary Doors drummer John Densmore is coming up right after this. 
Adam Carolla Show presents John Densmore's birthday cocktail party for December 1st. Let's see who's invited. American vocalist Lou Rawls is here. Woody Allen joins the party. Blue Oyster Colts, Eric Bloom. Bette Midler. Pablo Escobar. The great Richard Pryor joins us. Treat Williams. From Mark and Brian on KLOS, Mark Thompson. And Sarah Silverman. Happy birthday, John Densmore. He's on the Adam Carolla Show. Wow, that is a hell of a party, John. What a birthday. John yeah. Densmore, a legendary drummer from uh, The Doors and beyond, uh, has a book out, The Seekers, Meeting with Remarkable Musicians and Other Artists. It's available now on uh, Amazon. And uh, so good to meet you, John. Hey, uh, Adam. I, uh, I think I, I was in Glendale a few years ago. Oh, that's right. Your studio had a big sliding wood door. Yeah, though that that was a decade ago, probably. Oh well, you Two, know. Sorry, two thousand and two thousand and thirteen. That's that is that is correct. Now now it's all coming back to me. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. I'll be seventy six tomorrow, so you know it's all a blur. <laughs> God, you were so young when you started with the doors and what how old were you when you started early 20s um and uh the book so let's talk about meeting with the remarkable musicians and and others obviously you knew jim morrison very well uh but you got janice joplin and jerry lee lewis and patty smith and uh janice jop uh, i should say bob marley on here uh what's your recollections of uh janice joplin oh you know, I saw her uh, in between sets at the Fillmore. We ran over to see her because Jack Cassidy, the bass player in the Jefferson Airplane, said, you got to go see Big Brother. And I'm like, Big Brother? What, what a Nazi group? What is it? <laughs> and uh, walk in, and she's singing Down on Me. Oh, oh yeah. man, I knew. I knew she had it. And she was really sweet. And then I didn't meet her again till Woodstock, and then she had a monkey on her back, and she wasn't so sweet. So, you know, Janice and Jim are cautionary tales. The monkey is drugs? Yeah. Um, was everybody doing drugs back then, but some people were doing more? No, let me, let me break it down. Um, we were fooling around with then-legal LSD, and uh, pot, you know, psychedelics. We were like street scientists. And then the culture moved on to cocaine and heroin and whoa. I mean, even Jim thought that, wow, cocaine is kind of serious, isn't it? And, um, you know, it became cool to <laughs> do heroin, which is not cool with me. So what can I say? You, um, so I guess... <laughs> As the as the drummer, I was actually talking to uh, Tommy Lee about this, and I was talking to him about being loaded on stage, essentially. And I thought, well, maybe it's easier if you're the drummer. You don't have to remember the words. But he said, no, you have to kind of keep time for the whole band. So, like, if you're fucked up and you're drumming, it'll fuck up the whole set. Is that a true statement? Uh, totally. I mean, in, in the new book... Uh, I write about how for drummers, the, the first beat, well, for everyone, the first beat we heard was in the womb. It was our mother's heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that pulse that we're trying to get back to. And if you don't have it, all the flashy stuff isn't going to mean anything. Right. Even if you're not the drummer, you have to have an internal metronome or nobody's going to care. So where do you grow up and how does it start? When do you start drumming? What's, uh, what's your background? Well, I started piano when I was eight and I, and I loved it. I just was crazy for it. And then when I got to junior high, I knew that there wouldn't be any piano in the band or orchestra. So I, I wanted to play any instrument and I chose clarinet because Benny Goodman seemed cool, a little before my time, but he, 
he must have attracted girls, clarinet, yeah. Um, then the dentist said, no, John, you have braces. Uh, that instrument will push your teeth out. We're trying to push them back. Hmm. So I owe my career to the orthodontist, I guess. So you went from the piano to the clarinet, and then you picked up the drums after the orthodontist. Yeah, yeah. And how did you get hooked up with the rest of the doors? Well, as I said, we were experimenting. Robbie Krieger was a friend of mine who ultimately became the guitar player. Uh, we were experimenting with LSD, and we thought, well, this is a little shattering on the nervous system, so let's do this meditation thing. So we stumbled into Maharishi's meditation, which was, oh, I don't know, a year or so before the Beatles got on to him. And we thought that that would be a less shattering route. And um, that's where I met Ray. And then uh, I went down to his garage and met Jim. And the rest is history. Was that, Did you grow up around L.A.? Yeah. My mom was born in Santa Monica in 1904. Wow. Don't, <laughs> don't meet many people who are... Uh, yeah, my my family's the same way, like multi generation uh, California people. But you, most people are from somewhere else. You know, they came out here to do something. And so you and I have that in common. <clears throat> we we didn't come here to make it. Therefore, if we didn't make it, we don't have to crawl back home. <laughs> yeah, there's also nothing in the newspaper that has local boy local boy makes good kind of headlines too. That a lot of people I know who are from somewhere who came out here and, and were successful when they go back to their hometown, there's like a school gymnasium named after them or something or a plaque somewhere. But when you're from LA, no one gives a shit. You're just from LA. <laughs> there's no. There's, there's no yeah. plaque at North Hollywood High that says Adam Carolla went here. Where did, well, where, where'd you go to high school? I went to a University High School in West L.A. Which they would call a Uni High, right? Uni High, yeah. Where, where'd you go? North Hollywood High. Hey, hey. I was a, I was a Valley guy, so I guess you were kind of a over-the-hill kind of guy. I don't mean old. I mean uh, <laughs> on the city side, right? Yeah, but I don't think there was any uh, animosity towards the valley. We came to the valley all the time. That's where, you know, things were happening. Yeah, you could get your car reupholstered or something <laughs> like that in the valley. So yeah. uh, what did your parents do? My dad was an architect, and, um, you know, he, he went out on his own, and then he, he his appendix burst, and he didn't have any insurance, so he he— uh, ended up working for a big architectural firm, Welton Beckett, here in L.A. Were your parents supportive with the whole musician life lifestyle and the doors and all that kind of stuff? Did they love it? Did they hate it? Did they think it was dangerous, irresponsible? What was, what was their take on it? All of the above. <laughs> um, you know, they encouraged piano and and tolerated my drums. Uh, they knew I loved music, but they never, like me, never thought I could make a living at it. And at one point, just before the doors got going, my dad said, you know, why don't you go cut your hair and go back to college and get your, add one more year for a degree. And I didn't. Maybe I can get an honorary thing. Maybe UCLA can give me something, the hometown boy, like mm -hmm. you're talking. Was everybody at UCLA? Uh, I was at Valley State. Where's Valley State? Well, it's Cal State Northridge. Oh, okay. It, it was called SFVSC, yeah. San Fernando Valley State College. Yeah, State. so now it's now it's CSUN. My yeah. mom went to there. I went to Valley College, which is a junior yeah. college. It's over there in uh, Van Nuys. So uh, we're very Valley and uh, city centric here. So um, when the door, did you, did you realize like when you met Jim Morrison, did you realize there was some kind of spark there or something that was going on inside of him or did it take a little while? Well, uh, he was really shy and his vocal core, he wasn't confident. So he wasn't that full baritone wasn't, 
It'd be Jim Adam, calling from I heaven. I thought I turned off the friggin'. That's all right. We're, we're cutting this together, right? Ah, don't worry about it. That's what people like about podcasts. Okay. One more beep. So. So, um, yeah, Jim, Jim was shy and um, his full baritone hadn't matured. But I, I read these lyrics and I was just like, wow, th this is really wild. I love this idea of poetry on top of rock and roll. Uh, so I, I knew he had something. Like I knew Janice had something. Like I knew Bob Marley had something. Like I knew Gustavo Dudamel had something. And all these people I met before they took off. And that's what I write about in this new book. Do you think that for most of those people, it was just some sort of uh, God given or nature given or, you know, kind of in their DNA versus developed because they all were so young. I mean, they all developed it, but, but they were so young when they, when they were sort of showing glimpses of this kind of yeah. creative genius. Definitely gift, but you have to combine that with a lot of work. You got to practice. You got to uh, get enough technique to get your uniqueness across. Right. You can have too. You can have too much technique. Um, classical musicians are kind of rigid, but Gustavo Dudamel is not. He's completely aware of Led Zeppelin and salsa and heavy metal, and you know, takes in all stuff to feed his classical music. Did uh, the movie? It's one of my favorites, and I I I loved uh, I loved the movie so much that I actually went and got uh, Nobody Gets Out of Here Alive and read the book. One of the few books I've I've ever read in my life, honestly. But it it it's it stuck with me. the 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 music of the Doors I had to kind of mature to because it was a little too esoteric for me like when i was in high school you know it, it it wasn't pop or punk it it although it had elements of it like i always thought break on through it was like almost like one of the original punk songs like it feels like a punk rock song to me but i i learned to then appreciate the doors more and more as i got older and the in the crazy diversity of the of the songs that you guys created just, just the, I, I don't know that there's any band. I, you know, maybe Led Zeppelin, maybe that's had like this, this crazy sort of diversity of rock songs and sort of bizarre songs and anthems. And, uh, but the movie, did you appreciate it? Did you like it? Did you feel Oliver Stone got many things wrong? What was your take on it? I liked it. I thought Val Kilmer was astounding. He, he made me nervous on the set. I thought Jim was back. Um, it was primarily about uh, the sort of um, tortured artist. And I was pleased that there was a documentary that Johnny Depp narrated that uh, had a little more of the 60s in the period. And so the two of them together uh, kind of, I think, do the whole picture. Um, the Doors were an American melting pot. We got Robbie's flamenco and folk and Ray's blues from Chicago and, and his classical kind of uh, da, 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 the introduction to Light My Fire is kind of like Bach. Mm -hmm. And Jim had all these words and I was a real jazz nut. So maybe this uh, gumbo is uh, what makes us so unique because, uh, yeah, it's it's... You know, we do a song from a German opera and then we do sort of bossa nova influence stuff. Uh, maybe it's just the drumming, Adam. Uh, maybe that's the key. Well, I mean, you listen to the beginning of Break On Through and it's got great starts off with the with the drums. But then you hear songs like I'm Looking Down, but uh, Alabama song, the Whiskey Bar yeah. song and uh, right. Crystal Ship. And it's like songs I, I, I couldn't. I, you know, when I was younger, I liked the poppy stuff like uh, Lover Madly and, and uh, Break right. On Through and stuff like that. But when I got older, uh, 
I got more into the writers on the storm and and songs like um, you know like the Alabama song Crystal Ship. I, I I love that song. I wouldn't I didn't like it when I was sixteen, but I liked it when I was twenty six. <laughs> oh, Ray plays a beautiful piano solo on Crystal Ship. Maybe um, well I'm I kind of feel like. Uh, during the 60s, there was the Vietnam undeclared war, and and we were writing about the sort of dark underbelly of the country and with the end and like that. And so we were kind of, you know, like Riders on the Storm. Uh, Jim's got this um, killer on the road, brain squirming like a toad. It's it's Manson, you know. Right. So we we kind of. Uh, uh, we were not flower power, <laughs> but uh, we've lasted. I don't know. When I was talking to Robbie Krieger about it, I said, uh, when we're talking about, um, you know, and then he walked on down the hall and, you know, mother and, and all that stuff. And I said, did anyone raise their hand like at rehearsal and go, uh, Jim, let's say mom, I'd like a blow job, but do you have to fuck her? <laughs> Like that's weird, or or maybe a hand job or something. Like we tone it down a little bit, or was there? And and uh, he said, "No, we're all just kind of all in on everything." Was was that the case? Yeah, uh, telling Jim to change his lyrics was not on the table, and really, uh, I think if my recollection is correct, the first time I heard that was at the whiskey, and he just blurted it out in the middle this Oedipal soliloquy, and we got fired because of it. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, fortunately, we had just got a record deal. And uh, so. What What was you know. the, uh, I love the end. Man, I'll tell you one time, I'll tell you the Doors music can just set the mood. I remember listening when I drove from, I drove, I went out and saw a friend who was performing at the Caesars in Tahoe. And huh. we, we drove from Caesars in Tahoe to Yosemite. And it's a great mountain road that just goes on forever. And we just put on the best of the doors and we just listened to the doors the whole huh. time. And it was just, I don't know, it just set the table for whatever I was, was going on with me emotionally. But uh, what was the schedule? So you guys were playing the whiskey would you do two shows a night, one show a night? Would you perform? How many times a week would you perform? Oh, uh, five nights a week, uh, two shows a night. But really? Let me, go, let me go back for a second. Uh, L.A. Woman, I think, is like a perfect freeway driving song. And the end, it, it's this drone kind of thing. And, and in, the, in this new book I write about Ravi Shankar, and that's where it came from. We were dipped in Indian curry music, mm -hmm. uh, like the Beatles. And so that's where you get that hypnotic thing in the end. Yeah, it's like it's it's not really something you'd put on if you wanted to get people out onto the dance floor at a wedding. But all right, you can pot it down then, Dawson. So uh, do you remember some of the other bands that were sort of with you during those uh, Sunset Strip uh, whiskey days? Yeah, yeah. Um, all of them. I mean, let's see. The Birds, Frank Zappa, Captain Beefheart, uh, Them, which was Van Morrison. Right, and Them. Uh, right. They were all there, and they had to deal with the opening act. Were you, were you guys <laughs> the opening act? Yeah. And, and and we became friends with all of them. <laughs> but we, we, you know, we're... We needed to be reckoned with because we, we were strong. I mean, everyone would do their freeform dancing to light my fire, and then we'd close with the end, and everyone would walk out quietly. quietly and, and then the next band had to follow that. Not easy. No. And also, you know, you don't know it's the doors back then. I mean, you know it's the doors, but you don't know what the doors are going are right. gonna, to gonna become. And so yeah. you just think it's an opening band and the opening band is, is taken over the evening. And now you got to go, you got to go next. Yeah. 
Did you guys, uh, when you would go out on tour, did you take bands with you? No, no, we were, uh, well, the, the exciting time, certainly the big concerts were mass adulation and that was exciting, but just starting small concert hall, second bill was really, uh, invigorating like we're going to make a living at this we're going to pay the rent how great is that yeah at the at the beginning it's all exciting because you cannot believe that you're getting paid to do this thing you love right right, and then at some point it turns into a job and then there's a lot of people involved and then there's riders and hotels and shit and and then it's then you start so i guess at the beginning you pick out things you love about what you're doing. And at the end, you pick out things you hate about what you're doing. Damn, that is really smart. You've been around the block. I should write that shit down. (laughs) You know, um, uh, thinking about, uh, you don't know they're the doors yet. Uh, I have a chapter in the new book about Paul Simon, who I went and saw a few years ago. And he, you know, they were terrific. And I, I went backstage and I said, Paul, I hadn't seen you since Forest Hills. You were playing with Artie and we were the opening act. And I want to apologize 50 years later for Jim being so rude to you. Mm. <laughs> and Paul said, I remember that. And I couldn't figure out why. And, you know, because who was this kid? And then he became this giant icon with leather pants. And then Paul and I, Paul suggested that Jim was nervous. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that's it, you know, covering his nerves with the, uh, you know, defensive sort of attitude. Did he cover his nerves with bravado? Well, eventually he covered it with alcohol. Right. <laughs> yeah. What did he do to Paul Simon? Well, he just was rude. Paul came back to wish us good luck. We were about to go on stage and oh, be the opening act for them. And, and, and he just was kind of, didn't talk to him. They like, ignored him or whatever the hell. And uh, so uh, it was kind of healing for the two of us to go, yeah, yeah, that was it. Was, uh, you think it was Jim's shyness that caused some of this? Yeah, yeah. And um, I've, I've always been interested in his uh, relationship with his family, like, his dad was a rear admiral and he said his dad was dead and that kind of stuff. Like, uh, why do you think there was so much acrimony there between him and his family? Well, um, we are at a, we were at a time when the whole country was polarized into for and against the Vietnam war. Mm -hmm. You know, we're kind of polarized now too. We got to reach across the aisle somehow, but, uh, the ultimate uh, cutting of the umbilical cord, Jim said that his parents were deceased in his original bio, which they were not. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, his dad was uh, commanding a battleship in the Gulf of Tonkin during the Vietnam War, and we wrote uh, the song The Unknown Soldier. Uh, so kind of polar opposites there. But a beautiful thing happened years later. After Jim died, uh, we were offered obscene amounts of money to use our songs for commercials. And, and Jim was real upset over the idea, while he was alive, over the idea of, come on, Buick, light my fire, right. Buick car. And, and he didn't write light my fire primarily. And uh, I never forgot that. And so, uh, unfortunately, I got into a lawsuit with my bandmates and ultimately Jim's dad came and joined me and wanted to protect his son's lyrics after, after all of that, you know, after that friction, beautiful healing of the sixties. Was it, um, as you look back on the life of the doors, um, in Jim Morrison passing when he did, uh, in a way, it kind of preserves things because it just stops yeah. and yeah. there can be no reunion tours or yeah. Yeah. O- old old guy tours or any of that stuff. It's kind of in a time capsule. And 
there's something to be said for that sort of artistically in, in terms of how history is written, but no one wanted Jim Morrison to expire. Uh, so how do you, how do you look, are you philosophical about it or how do you, how do you look at that at that time? Oh, I'm philosophical now. At, at first, it took me a few years to grieve over his demise because I was so pissed off at him for, um, you know, we didn't have substance abuse clinics. We didn't know he had a disease. And so um, it took a while. Now I look back and eh, he was one of those guys that was meant to pack it in 27 years and get out of here quick, you know. And I'm okay with that. But it's a different time now. You know, I'm asked uh, if he was around, would he be clean and sober? Well, I used to say, nah, kamikaze drunk. I changed that uh, answer. I think about Clapton and, and Eminem, and, you know, it's a different time. And so maybe he'd be around. Um, do you remember... So in the movie, you guys all were at the birthday party and then uh, Jim took off for Paris, I guess. Uh, is that, did it really play out that way? Yeah, sure did. And when he left, was there any proclamations about, you know, I'll be back in March and we'll get into the studio or we got a tour lined up or any of that? There wasn't any of that, but he... I was the last member to speak to him. He called me from Paris, uh, wondering how uh, L.A. Woman was doing. And I said, oh, man, we're back. <laughs> they they want a second single after Lover Madly, uh, Riders on the Storm. And and he said, OK, great, I'll be back. You know, we'll, we'll make some more music. Um, you remember where you were when you heard the news that he passed? Yeah, Robbie and I and Ray were together jamming, and it didn't feel real, you know? I, I thought, oh, he'll be an Irish drunk till he was 80. But, you know, <laughs> he was kind of crazy from the beginning. I kind of subliminally knew it wasn't going to be a, a long life. So you guys were all together when you got the news. Yeah, and... and uh we kind of looked at each other and then we just started playing some music. And I don't think we were taking it in. We weren't really sure. There was fake rumors of Paul McCartney's death and, you know, it's weird. Yeah, it's back then when information took a while to disseminate and to vet and stuff because, uh, I don't know, you guys got a phone call, I guess, or somebody yeah. said something from a newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then for, for, for the doors, was there any discussion about, well, we need to get this guy to replace Jim or we got all this, we got all these contracts. We got all these tour dates that are like out in front of us. Like we're leaving all this money on the table. Was there any discussion of that or, or having, I don't know, Van Morrison comes in and joins yeah. the doors. Well, uh, first we were entertaining the idea of someone trying to fill Jim's leather pants. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, then we made a couple albums with Ray and Robbie singing. And th they weren't great singers, but it was smart because it avoided that trap. Right. Who the hell is going to, you know, be Jim? And I, um, I'm really uh, pleased that I stumbled into writing and uh, uh, it's something I can do, you know, at home without any crazy musicians. It's not as fun as playing in a band, but it's another avenue of creativity that I'm, I'm pleased to be able to have. Well, I want to talk about the uh, book, and I want to talk about uh, what some of these, your takeaway was from some of these uh, icons. Like, you know, you got Bob Marley and Jerry Lee Lewis, two incredible artists, but uh, they probably don't get further apart in the spectrum than uh, Bob Marley and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. So we'll talk about that in one second. Let me just take care of a little business here. Sling TV, tired of the huge cable bills, want to cut the cord, but uh, worried about missing your favorite shows? Sling TV, same top cable channels for as little as half the price, plus over 50,000 on-demand shows and movies. 
Make the smart choice and uh, save by switching to Sling TV. And uh, don't miss a thing except the giant cable bills. Sling has millions of subscribers. It starts at uh, just 30 bucks a month for 30 top channels. Plus, they offer bundles to get uh, local channels for free so you can save even more. Make the smart choice and switch to Sling TV. Get the best cable for the best price. It's easy to switch. It is uh, Sling TV. Learn more at sling.com slash Adam. That is S-L-I-N-G dot com slash Adam. Sling TV. All right, take a quick break. We'll come back more with John Densmore right after this. All right, we're back with John Densmore, legendary drummer, of course, for The Doors. Probably one of the bands that gets better as the years wear on. Certain bands were, you know, popular when they were out. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, Jerry and the Pacemakers or something. <laughs> <laughs> but as the years wear on, you know... The history has not been kind. I feel like the Doors, because of their super crazy eclectic uh, catalog of music, has actually aged like like fine wine. Like the the songs are every bit as interesting. The stuff it's not it, it's not of a time per se. It's kind of timeless, which which good art always is. Whether it's a yeah. painting or a song, you know, there's nothing worse than hearing a song from 1985 and you go, oh, that's an 80s song. You can you can hear it, you know. Yeah. But Well, thank you. Uh, maybe partially that's yeah. also due to our longtime engineer, Bruce Botnick, who also co-produced L.A. Woman with us. Um, as each... Uh, new uh, era of technology has come in, you know, CDs and streaming and whatever the hell it is. He is on it as far as keeping our sound. He remasters and all this stuff to, to keep it really current with the latest techno stuff. And that's helpful. So uh, let's talk Bob Marley and Jerry Lee Lewis. What's, what's the experience with them? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of different. I mean, sure. Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, we wanted to give a tip of the hat to to the 50s rockers uh, whose shoulders were all on. And at the time, we were going to play the Hollywood Bowl, and we asked them if we could have Johnny Cash open. And this was before the Johnny Cash TV show. And they said, no, no, he's a felon. Sorry. Hmm. Well, Okay. And then we got to the forum a year later and, and we got enough power to insist on who we wanted. And we said, Jerry Lee Lewis. And they said, fine, the, the fans won't know who he is. And we said, we don't care. What, you know, what year is this? Oh, don't press me, Adam. 67, <laughs> uh, 68? Yeah. So, no, 68 or nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he was playing country music at the time, but he played all his hits, and and some of the audience was going, Jim, Jim. Right. And he got on the piano and at the end said, for those who liked me, God love you, and for the rest of you, I hope you have a heart attack. <laughs> it's great. How that connects to Bob Marley, I, I have no idea. Uh, I just stumbled in, uh, into uh, reggae before it came to the States, I was doing an album in Jamaica, and I came back, and I said to Linda Ronstadt's bass player, Kenny Edwards, late, great Kenny, listen to this stuff. Listen to the bass line. It, it, it's really weird. And he said, what is it, Reggie? <laughs> I said, no, reggae, reggae. And uh, a year later, Linda covered uh, Many Rivers to Cross, number one hit covering Jimmy Cliff. So you're welcome, Linda. And uh, the book also has, uh, well, I only have a short a short list of people. I got uh, Patti Smith and Marley. L let me say, Jerry Adam, Leo. the reason mm. it's so eclectic is because this is what fed me as a kid at going, you know, and maybe this is why The Doors also was so diverse. We take in all f forms of music, you know, if it's good. And... Uh, 
what comes out, you know. Is- no, no, it's it's there's definitely some you know uh, diversity. I always uh, always I always remember Dr. Drew said you know ge- genetic diversity makes for the strongest um, creature. So it's like the the oh. mutts are hardier than the purebreds. You know what I mean? Oh, the, the, I forgot the, about that. The, That's the, good. I'm going to take that in my next interview and <laughs> spew it out like it's my own. It's Go like- ahead. Don't give me or Drew credit that. <laughs> To, but we all kind of know that obviously the mutts are a lot hardier than, yeah. than the purebreds. And and the bands that are sort of purebreds, it's just kind of one note, pardon the pun. Yeah. Like it just yeah, feels yeah, yeah. like four guys or five guys that are all kind of thinking the same thing. And like, and so I guess a band would be like getting back to your dad's profession. It'd be like being an architect. And, and maybe you don't want five architects that are all trained at the same place and like the same architecture and have the same background. Maybe, yeah. you, maybe you want a much more or designing a car or anything. Maybe you want a much more, a much more diverse background. And then everyone's kind of bringing what they have, like some sort of great potluck meal, you know, everyone's exactly. cooking their own dish. Exactly. And another thing I write about is dynamics. Like, um, if you're just playing all at one level, loud the whole time, it's kind of like a one note thing, like you're talking about. And so in the end, it'll be real soft and quiet and then it'll get real loud and, and have all the feelings in between. And so that's kind of more like all the human emotions in there. And I think that's uh, appealing. But that also comes from a, a really secure place because when you're in front of a audience and you're at the whiskey and people are drinking and it's Saturday night, Uh your impulse is just to come out and just try to cover them with sonically cover them. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like stand up comedians when they start out, they talk real fast and they just kind of mow right through their, their jokes. And, and, you know, the great ones, you see Dave Chappelle says something, takes a draw off a cigarette takes a sip off a beer, counts right. to 10 Mississippi. And we all know it's better that way with the foreplay, but it takes a kind of security to do that. And I'm curious, like, who was, where that security was coming from as a young band to really just take your time up there? Well, I got very fed by classical music. And uh, if you see Gustavo Dudamel conducting the L.A. Philharmonic, he'll hold his arms up when he's done with Beethoven for 20 minutes, which is a lot of sound. And you know, you're not supposed to applaud till he puts his hands down and he waits and it's silent and it's so powerful. It's just like, uh, I quote Gary Shandling in this book, a comedian who talks about the power of silence. Like he's standing next to Rip Torn in the, what was that? Uh, Larry Sanders. And the Larry Sanders show. Yeah. yeah. They're standing next to the monitor. <laughs> no dialogue for like a minute on TV. Right. Wow. But it kind of was powerful. So did uh in the movie uh Jim turned his back to the audience at the at the beginning. Is that yeah. is, is that a true story? Yeah, that's that's out of shyness. Did that go on for a while? A little while, not too long. I mean, all through rehearsing, he did that because he he never played an instrument, never sang. He was pretty insecure about it. And then he turned into the Lizard King. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Did Was there a point with the gym where you kind of felt like you'd lost him? Yeah. Uh, around the middle album, Waiting for the Sun, he was just starting to drink too much and and I wouldn't go out with him because you know then I'd have to drink so uh it was tough you know was uh was everyone hanging out uh, was he hanging out at uh, Barney's Beanery uh, back then sure sure and then he got his group of drinking buddies that you know so yeah I think Michael Manson probably played uh I think Michael Manson in the movie was one of his drinking buddies, but I'm trying to think of uh, who who that was. So um, 
So for the doors, what do you think the, where was the sweet spot for the doors? Do you remember one tour, one album? Do you remember when it was just, at the beginning, you're struggling. So that's, you know, that's a struggle. At the end, like I said, it's you're getting caught up in everything but the but the music. Uh, do you remember kind of where 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 you guys just had it right, or at least to every, you? It, yeah, every time we were in the studio, we had it right. I mean, middle period, Jim was drinking too much, um, but somehow, whenever we were recording, he knew that this is going to be uh, uh, around for posterity. So let's get it right, and we really cared about the songs, and we. Well, okay, so he says in the early days, uh, yeah, I'm the lyricist, but I don't know how to play a chord on any instrument. Let's say all songs written by the doors, not lyrics and music by blah, 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 blah. Wow, what a gesture. So everybody's encouraged to put in 200%. Maybe that's part of it, you know? Yeah, well, the doors had songs that were, you know, light my fire and touch me and then the movie, I guess Jim didn't like touch me. And, uh, they had a couple other songs like break on through where you must've known those were going to be hits right from jump street. But then there were other songs that were esoteric, like maybe you didn't know those were going to be hits. Did you, did you kind of break them down that way? Or did you think that way? Yeah, I, I knew. Uh, Lover Madly was going to be a hit. I had no idea that Riders on the Storm, I knew it was mysterious. I loved the feel, but I knew, I didn't know it was going to be so, uh, oh, enduring. God, it's just, you know, uh, Carlos Santana said to me, man, the mood you guys did on that just gets me. And I, you know, wow, yeah. Was that one of the last songs Jim recorded? Correct. Yeah. And was he around to experience the success of that song? No, he was in Paris and he called me and I told him about it. I said, man, this is, it's really doing well. Back and when, it, I don't know, that song's six and a half minutes long or something like. Yeah. It's speaking of foreplay, like you can't do that anymore. They're not going to. It's not going to get played on the radio if there is even a radio anymore. But <laughs> yeah, those, those songs, there is some, again, there's a kind of security that comes with that pace and with that cadence. And, uh, and also there's something to, uh, a song that's not two minutes and 45 seconds long. Like you don't, you know, it's funny when a, when a song is, you know, under three minutes, when the song starts, you're already kind of hearing the end in your, yeah. in your head, you know, pardon the pun. But, and like, this is the end. Like, it feels like a, a, a great movie where we're just going to start heading into different parts of it. You know, uh, we're going to head into this chapter and that chapter. All right. So we recorded Light My Fire and it was six minutes and the record company said it's a hit. And we said, yeah. And they said, but we got to cut it down to three. I went, oh, no. And they did it anyway. And then FM radio was becoming underground FM popular. And, and they started bragging about playing the long version of Light My Fire. Mm -hmm. And damned if we didn't really break that three-minute barrier for, for a year or two there. I felt great. Yeah. And it's back when bands... Well, maybe they weren't doing it. Yeah, they weren't really doing it before the doors because it was all this kind of British invasion stuff and pop stuff and kind of quickie stuff. But uh, then after that, there was a lot of your, I don't know, Inagata De Vitas and, uh, and yeah. uh, you know, Deep Purples doing, I don't know, Burn or something, <laughs> something like that, which is one of my favorite rock. I should ask you as a drummer, to me, one of the greatest drumming rock songs ever is Burn. Uh, Ian Pace, uh, Deep Purple. I don't know. Do you have, who are some of your rock drumming icons? Well, I mean, I write about Elvin Jones, who I saw as a kid who backed up John Coltrane. So my icons were these jazz guys. And maybe where that's where this long form came in. 
because when I met Ray, the keyboard player, we talked about Miles Davis and and then we listened to Ravi Shankar and ragas were long and classical music is long. So I don't know. That's the mold we come out of. I tend, the music I like the most, the rock music I like the most are the guys who have the classical training or background or the jazz training and background. I, I, I find that that, as we spoke of before, that diversity uh, ends up translating perfectly in, into the rock genre. Gives it depth. Um, how often do you play the drums? This is a modern day question. You mean, you mean these, these things right here? I'm looking at me? a yeah, giant kit behind you. <laughs> well, this is my writing room. And, uh, when I, uh, when I get stuck trying to find music in between the sentences on the computer, I'll go back there and hit it. And I, I, you know, I play, uh, poetry, uh, play hand drums and read poetry. I was doing that in clubs before this pandemic, which if it was a good night, I got off as much as Madison Square Garden because there's something precious about the moment in there when it's really working well with the audience. Does, uh, do the Doors own their catalog? Do you guys have all the publishing and that stuff or is that a messy legal something? Um, when Light My Fire became number one for 26 weeks, our, our, our lawyer called up uh, the head of the record company and said, <clears throat> give the boys back their gold, which he did. So, Oh, they did? Yep. That, that's, now, I'm guessing they're not magnanimous people who do things for no reason when it comes to parting with money. So I'm... I'm guessing they did that to stay in the good graces of the doors because they wanted all the follow-up records. Well, yeah, and and Electra Records was kind of a small boutique label. And we actually talked to the president and had a relationship. It wasn't a giant corp. So that felt really good. And, uh, you know, so. What label were the, were the doors with Electra all the way through? Yeah. That's kind of unique these days. Yeah. Did, yeah, they left us alone. It was good. <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing. Hey, Adam, yeah. Adam uh, I'm thinking about the valley where you come from. Uh -huh. you see, see this sign behind me? <clears throat> yeah. It says, uh, yeah. Densmore Street and uh, uh, Densmore Avenue and Morrison Street. All right. I'm going to give you a little San Fernando anecdote. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up here. I'm driving in the valley, and I, I'm on Ventura Boulevard, and I, I see Densmore Street, which I've seen all my life, and say, oh, cool, there's a street named after me or whatever the hell. A few years ago, well, I got a little time. I think I'll make a right turn and go down and, and see what's up on Densmore Street, and it crosses Morrison Street. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, mind-blowing. <laughs> Morrison, so, uh, Morrison. I, I, I got Eric Garcetti to, to put the two signs together on one pole and got a little photo op. But, you know, they made these names up hundreds of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had friends who lived uh, on Morrison Street. Like Morrison was pretty popular. I don't remember Densmore, sorry, as yeah. much. But Morrison, you know, just ran right through North Hollywood and Valley Village yeah. and Studio right. City and, you know, yeah. where that's all where I just grew up out yeah. there. So um, where were you? So when you were on Ventura Boulevard and you turned on to Densmore, were you like between Whitsitt and Coldwater or, or Laurel or something? You remember? Somewhere around Encino. Oh, Encino. Right. A little bit, a uh, little bit deeper into into the valley so yeah. uh you guys kept your publishing and so essentially you don't financially you don't need to work right i mean what you do is out of passion but not because you're desperate for the cash yeah i'm i'm very blessed to be okay during this this era right now where man oh man the entire uh music, well, all entertainment, sports, everything. God, it's, wow. Uh, it's sad. I miss going and hearing live music. Yeah. But it'll come around. I mean, you know. And it, it, 
that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, I like the old timer landline because uh, I was just thinking back. I have a bunch of young guys who work for me, and I remember about six years ago, I was explaining, I moved, and I got to get a landline put in, and they said, what for? And I said, because <laughs> you need a landline. And they said, why? And I said, because you're in a house, you idiot. When you're in a house, you need a landline. And they said, why? <laughs> I said, because it is. That's the way it works, you know? Yeah, well, you know. I mean, I'm afraid to turn on the television. I asked my kids to do it. You know, too many buttons. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. And if you push the wrong one, yeah. you'll 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 be on antenna Z, and you'll never <laughs> find your way back to Sports Center. So, um, what for you then? After so, Jim dies in sixty nine, seventy. What's he dies? Seventy one. Seventy one. Sorry. Yeah. Jim dies in 71. You are 25. I mean, uh, let's see. What are you in 71? 71. 26. 26. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're young as hell. You've, you've toured the world. Uh, I'm guessing you guys toured the world. I'm, I'm trying to think because in the movie it was, you know, Florida and playing other, other gigs, but I, you must have toured the world, right? Well, we toured Europe, but certainly. Right. And uh, now you're 26. What what was your next move? Well, um, we had a really good trio behind Jim, so we kept playing and did a few albums and toured. And But then after a little while, it was like, all right, this is ridiculous. Our focal point is gone. And uh, Ray and Robbie went off on individual uh, projects, and I stumbled into Peggy Fury's acting class, which I write about in this book. And I thought, man, I am as nervous in front of 12 people as 12,000, and I don't have my drums as my instrument. This will keep me out of trouble. And Mm. that kind of segued me into writing. And so I, I, you know, wrote uh, Riders on the Storm, which was a bestseller. I still didn't feel like I could say I was a writer. I knew I was a musician. But after a few more years of small articles and stuff, I f- felt like I, I definitely had my, my, my own prose voice. Yeah. And I, I was thinking about the drum set. Like, in a way, you can, like, physically hide behind it a little bit. I'm not yeah. saying you were, but I mean, you, you physically, it's like you have a barrier up. Like it's like, yeah. it's like, like, like being behind the counter or something. And, uh, as an actor, you just got to just step out get right next to that fourth wall. And, uh, everyone can see what you're thinking. Your, your body is the instrument. That's pretty, pretty close to the skin. Um, let me plug the book, uh, the seekers, Meeting with Remarkable Musicians and Other Artists. It's available now on uh, Amazon. And uh, John, when the, uh, I don't know, when the pandemic blows over, considering you're your local guy, you're in L.A., right? Yep. Uh, well, we're out in the, out in the valley. So uh, come back in, see just what we've done with the place since we removed the sliding door. <laughs> you know, uh, Probably the paperback will be out next holiday season, and maybe we'll be out of the woods and we can hang. I would uh, appreciate that. I got a bunch of cool cars I can show you. I know okay. Jim, I think Jim's uh, 427 Mustang, it's like big block Mustang or something. 350 Shelby. Oh, it's a 350 Shelby, was it? That just yeah. went up for sale at an auction or something like that? So, Don't know about that, but I sure enjoyed the Ford Ferrari movie. Well, if you enjoyed uh, Ford v. Ferrari, I got a documentary on uh, Netflix. You can have your kid pull up the Netflix for you. Okay. And it's called The 24-Hour War, and we actually made the documentary before Ford v. Ferrari, which is Ford versus Ferrari at Le Mans. So if you like okay. if you like documentaries and uh, you like that story of Ford versus uh, Ferrari, well, we got the definitive uh, doc on it. I'm gonna check it out. It's on uh, it's on Netflix. If you'd like to enjoy that, uh, we'll okay. email you uh, the info. By the way, so uh, enjoy that. 
will check the book out. John Densmore, thanks for joining us, my friend. Hey, Adam, a real pleasure. We'll come. We'll see you soon in, in the flesh. Thanks, my friend. Bye-bye. All right. Let me tell you about uh, Tommy John. 2020 has been uh, uncomfortable in many ways. But uh, now we'll bring the comfort back with Tommy John. You can shop their extended Cyber Monday sale right now. Give the gift of comfort to everyone on your list. And do it for yourself, too. Say bye to the old stained sweatpants. Get that loungewear. So comfortable. Oh, the best part about it, getting cold outside. Plus, Tommy John's loungewear, pajamas, and underwear come in limited edition sets. Perfect for gifting, but uh, they'll sell out quick. So get those orders in soon. It's Tommy John. And uh, they got the customer favor, the hammock pou- pouch underwear, which is back in stock now. But order now because uh, they sold out in six days last time. It's the best. I'm wearing mine right now. Once you get into Tommy John, you won't get into anything else. Right, Dawson? Shop Tommy John's extended Cyber Day Monday. St- Shop Tommy John's extended Cyber Monday sale right now to make sure your gifts arrive by the holidays. Go to TommyJohn.com slash Adam for 20% off site-wide. Get 20% off for a limited time only at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. All right. Uh, I want to thank uh, John Densmore for coming in or Zooming. <clears throat> zooming in you guys can go to adamcroll.com for uh, all that you uh, want to know about live shows everywhere i'm your emotional support animal i got a book too enjoy that and uh, write a uh, write a review i'll read it uh, on amazon and until next time this is adam Kroll for john densmore and gina grandball brian say mahala Follow the Adam Carolla Show on Twitter at Adam Carolla Show. Follow us on Twitter at Adam Carolla. You can leave us a voicemail at 888-634-1744. And be sure and pick up Adam's new book, I'm Your Emotional Support Animal. It's available everywhere. Get the links at adamcarolla.com. Adam Carolla.